didn't bring hats, but this is a different <laughs> hat. Uh, I'm lucky I get to play different roles on different things. One of the roles I've played for many, many years is working with large companies, supply chains, large scale change. I'm delighted to meet recently James Goudreau, who's with Novartis, who's thinking about the same stuff, but you had a previous career. I did. As well, and uh, one of my other hats interacted with one of your other hats or previous hats, so start there yeah. and then we'll go forward. Yeah, so I've got a little bit of a non-traditional role into private sector and especially into pharma. Uh, before I joined Novartis as the head of climate, uh, I retired as a U.S. Navy captain and spent the last five years of my career in the Pentagon working as uh, at one point, the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy, which is a long title. We actually have an acronym for that because, of course, we have acronyms for everything in the Navy. But I was focused on climate resilience, climate security, energy security from a strategic perspective and diversifying the supply chain, um, and really looking at the impact from an operational perspective, connecting it to the mission, knowing what was critical, and protecting those most critical assets uh, and, and aspects of the operations. And then came into private sector and, and brought that into the brand new role of head of climate at Novartis, which combined the, the work they'd been doing for years in mitigation and added an adaptation layer to it. So I absolutely agree with you. You can't talk mitigation without talking adaptation. And you, you can't give up on either. You have to work both, and you have to work both intelligently. Yes, although he's not a convert. He was there probably before I was. <laughs> uh, let me ask you first, though. Uh, the Navy and Novartis and the business world in general would be a little different. How do you think, as you get started in this, about goals and motivations, getting them mm. set? It, does it come with goal? Does it come with motivations? I'm currently working with a very large company on greenhouse gas matters. Uh, in January, on January 1st, they had their new annual comp plan. Unlike any previous year, uh, the executives I'm working with now had a had greenhouse gas do something about greenhouse gases. I think probably the precise wording in their comp plan, mm -hmm. and it's a check the box. It's not a proportional thing, but all of a sudden the names of all my meetings changed. They were efficiency, you know, reengineer, redesign. Amory and I do a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, but starting January 1st, every meeting was low greenhouse gas efficiency, <laughs> whatever, whatever, because everybody wanted to say. I'm working on greenhouse gas now. Yeah. So tell us the Novartis version of that. Is there one? Uh, there is. And, and, you know, and I think every organization is a little bit different. Culturally, there's a different reason for people to do this when you hear the narrative. At the end of the day, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions and making your operation more resilient, more effective, more cost effective, more profitable, uh, more able to continue through disruptions. It's the same thing, whether you're talking about a mission in the Navy or business continuity and resilience within the corporate world. Um, budgets are the same everywhere. They're never as big as you want them to be, and they're always going to be smaller next year. At least that's, that's, that's just the conversation you always have. And you always have to fight over it. And you always have to fight over it. So, you know, who's going to get what piece of the pie? Now, for Novartis, one of the first things that I did when I arrived was help with redesigning the corporate environmental sustainability strategy. So as of last year, board approved, executive committee approved. Goal is to be carbon neutral and own operations by 2025. A 50% reduction in carbon footprint by 2030 across our entire value chain. So scopes one, two, and three. So all of our upstream and downstream supply chain partners are now getting involved in this conversation. Also aggressive goals in water and waste, 50% reduction in waste produced by 2025, 50% reduction in water consumed by 2025, reach plastic neutrality by 2030, become water neutral in water scarce areas by 2030. So why do this? Well, there are a lot of reasons for disruption and why to change what you've done in the past. Some of those pressures come internally. Obviously, the ability to run and, and run and operate a business more effectively, efficiently, more profitably, maintain your business through disruptions. Um, those are pretty standard discussions. Some of those disruptions, though, can come from externally, not from a change in environmental conditions, mm -hmm. but a change in the business environment, a change in your partnership and your contract. You know, so if you take a look at corporations, and as one of the few corporate guys who's here over the, over the, the few days, a company's contract with society has changed. Our ability to operate in markets has changed. And the requirement to act more responsibly, act more sustainably, um, is now tied with a long-term vision. And 
and I think you know there's a lot of discussion about do companies look simply at the quarterly profit line and ignore five years, two years, three years, 10 years, 20 years? Does that threaten a company's existence? And so the long-term strategic view that we had within the Navy and the Marine Corps mm -hmm. is becoming more acknowledged as a critical long-term view in the corporate world. That if you want to have your company around in 20 years from now, you need to know where you are and what your risks are, whether that's a physical risk or a transition risk from a, from a policy issue. I used to think that small and middle-sized companies would lead in this, but uh, well, I think they have roles. I think that actually, in, in many cases, the big companies that want to be around forever have realized that there's a license to operate and they're in danger. Yeah, I think so. I, and I think also one of the things that you know, and you asked, why do you set the goals and how do you set the goals? And I think that's one of the disruptions and one of the changes. You realize that the rate of change mm. exceeds the rate of change in the past. And continuing to operate your business in the way that you've done for decades previously and feeling comfortable about it shouldn't really match up with what you're thinking about the future. Where we're seeing change happen, the rate of change and the impact of that change on systems Mm. especially interdependent systems, is much more marked than we've seen before. So you can't rely on the same enterprise risk management strategy you did before. Um, so, you know, for instance, you said, how do you set those goals? Part of it comes back to knowing who you are, knowing mm. your critical mission, and I mentioned that. So for instance, Novartis is a global healthcare corporation. We care and cure. We make medicines that we have to get to a patient. So understanding the role that mitigation plays in reducing the impact of the climate and adaptation throughout communities that we serve, whether it's where our people are as part of the company, their families, our patients, um, the communities that we serve more broadly, these systems are gonna be disrupted. And well, being able to make medicine and get it to a person in that system is gonna look dramatically different 15 years from now than it does today. Let me push you for another piece of practical, practical input, maybe from your Navy training, but uh, we were chatting about this the other day. Uh, you brought up the concept of criticality. What is criticality and how do you think about criticality as you're starting to deal with the fact that uh, your budget's always getting squeezed and people yeah. are always fighting over capital and regardless of how big and powerful a company is, it never has enough people or resources to do everything, so it right. fights. And if you're the new guy, you don't usually win the fights and you're yeah. kind of the new guy. So tell me more about criticality. End of the day, whatever your mission is, is gonna determine what your criticality is. So if I have, for instance, in Novartis, if there's some place in the world that we have one location where we make a life-saving medicine, that's pretty critical. If we have one profit center that's particularly profitable and that allows us to roll $6 billion a year into research for Novartis, that's pretty critical. If we have a medicine that we're producing as part of our access to medicines and providing to impacted communities in Africa, that's pretty critical. So does everybody agree? Do they all have their little card and like number one is this, number two is that? No, they never <laughs> do. No organization ever will. Uh, and that's okay, there's never a perfect answer. But if you can put the information in front of the decision makers and say, here's the rate of change, here's the risk, here's what the potential impact is, and every projection you make is mm -hmm. always gonna be wrong. So if I showed you my little coastal chart, yeah. Except this time it would be a, like no, all of Lo Novartis's locations yeah. start and all the risks. What would you do with it? I would do exactly what I'm doing with it right now because we did the same exercise last year Good. with the MIT joint program on um, the science and policy of global change. And did an initial triage across our, our operations globally to understand when you take a look at water scarcity, heat, ev heat events, flooding from either sea level rise or severe weather impact, um, we are seeing the rate of change uh, is much greater issue in some of those locations. So bringing that to the folks involved in the strategy, in the enterprise risk management world, in the operations world, and say, here's what's changing. Let's put this alongside all of the other things. Let's start to make those choices and decisions. And it's very early days in that because it's mm -hmm. we're still developing information just like a lot of other companies. So at what point do you make those decisions? At what point do you disclose those decisions? is a very complex process, and it sounds very different company by company. When you talk about disclosure, you mean outside the company, mm -hmm. in the public, because it's relevant, right? It's relevant, absolutely. So if, if you're Maybe a Maybe I won't invest in you if you yep. don't have your factory in my favorite place. I exactly, and you know, obviously a lot of external pressure with the work that uh, Bloomberg has done 
with a task force on climate-related financial disclosures, TCFD, for those of you who don't live in that particular world every day. You know, understand your risk, assess it, monetize it, and then disclose it. You know, it's good long-term management. Uh, if you want to be around, you have to know what your risk is. Now, how far you go in disclosing it, how you monetize that, how you describe it, that's going to change company by company, mm. um, as well it should. The company is going to have to understand what is right for them. I will say, though, one of the biggest adaptations, one of the biggest changes as a result of climate change is going to have to be how companies work with their supply chain. In you, because we've talked today about physical risks, we've talked about policy changes, we've talked about carbon pricing, you know, and Novartis encourages carbon pricing. You know, it's, it's a good mechanism to level the playing field and also induce the change that needs to happen across multiple sectors. But businesses can no longer think within their sector and just in a silo. They can't think of this as an issue that only impacts their operating site. Because if I invest in resilience at an operating site, and I keep the lights on, and I keep the water out, and I can still, in theory, make a drug that a patient needs somewhere in the world, if I can't get my associates to the plant, if I can't get critical supplies into the plant to continue production, and if I can't ship finished product out to the distributed healthcare networks that need those drugs, then it's as if I never kept the lights on. So a lot of your products are perishable, right? So yeah. you, this has to... Keep some, churning some more, yeah, some more than others, and some are customized to an individual patient. Um, at the end of the day, this is a discussion about collaborative work towards regional climate resilience, hmm. towards understanding where the interdependencies are between the transportation network, the logistics network, um, the the governance in in a particular area, and how do you bring those together? For instance, we want to be using nothing but, but renewable energy by 2025. We want to reduce our carbon footprint by 50% by 2030. Small and medium companies in our supply chain don't necessarily have the staff to go out and negotiate a power purchase agreement. Maybe the only thing they can do is take advantage of a green tariff if it's offered, mm -hmm. if it's offered in the market that they're in. And we're in 110 different countries. We've got 105,000 associates. Um, so when you take a look at where we operate, those options aren't always gonna be available. So building the ability for smaller and medium companies to access renewable energy because we work with them building the ability for those companies to build efficiency. Because I think Heidi was absolutely right. You gotta eat your vegetables. Everything has to be based on a foundation of efficiency first, shift to renewables, and then develop a credible, transparent offset strategy. Fantastic. Credible and transparent, not greenwashing. It's interesting you say transparent. How do you ensure that it looks, feels, and is transparent? So do you follow the RE100 criteria for renewables? Um, do you follow accepted uh, criteria from the advocacy world, whether it's WRI, whether it's GRI, World Business Council on Sustainable Development, Greenpeace, Nature Conservancy? You know, are you doing something that lines up with the greenhouse protocols and, and is in alignment with that? And people, although they may disagree on the exact approach, they say, OK, that's a, that's a generally accepted approach. Maybe it could be better. Maybe it's not perfect, but legitimate enduring change is happening. And I think you know if you take a look at what has happened with electricity, same thing has to happen with natural gas. We're a commercial company that needs renewable or bio-based, bio-derived natural gas alternatives. We can't electrify everything across our production plants, which means we still have scope one emissions that we're going to have to tackle mm -hmm. and be able to face the public. And, and look in the mirror every day and say, yeah, we, we did something that is legitimate and has enduring change. Very good. I'm going to call this a wrap. Excellent.